Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, I would just like to thank Thermo Fisher for having me to present at their workshop, and I'd also just like to thank all of you for joining us here this afternoon. Uh, as it was just mentioned, my name is Alex Chubik, and I'm currently working on the research and development of GeneSeq's sequencing lab. Uh, GeneSeq is currently working in collaboration with Thermo Fisher to develop a lab that is capable of uh, genotyping samples by sequencing through the use of the iEnableSeq technology. Uh, which actually brings me to the topic of my presentation, which is genotype by sequencing through eye and ample sleep technology, a tool for genetic trait selection. Uh, but before I begin to tell you a little bit about GeneSeq's new product, I'd first like to tell you a little bit about the company itself. So uh, if you're ever looking to locate us, uh, GeneSeq is a 30,000 square foot uh, gen genetics lab based out of Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, in its lab in Nebraska, uh, GeneSeq is currently employing a little under 130 uh, scientists and technicians. Along with those technicians and scientists, GeneSeq also works around uh, the globe with uh, labs located in Brazil, Canada, China, and the UK. Uh, through those collaborations and the hard work of its employees, GeneSeq has been able to provide its customers with fast, accurate, and affordable DNA services since 1998. And it's through these services that GeneSeq has earned the title of being the world's leading commercial agriculture and genomics lab. Uh, with its prestigious reputation, GeneSeq has attained the business of several clients over the years. And those clients, on average, uh, usually send in large volumes of samples. Uh, and those orders that we receive can uh, have samples from varying types, which include hair, tissue, semen, blood, and swabs. Uh, and usually, on average, we usually find ourselves processing around 150,000 uh, 150, samples per month. Uh, to process these samples, GeneSeq has invested in several technologies that has allowed itself to offer multiple platforms to its, uh, to its customers. Uh, when GeneSeq was first established, the only uh, way it was uh, the only platform it was able to offer services through were the AB. Sorry, forgot to advance that. Uh, were through the ABI and Litecore platforms. Uh, these two platforms utilized microsatellite panels for identity management and single gene test for selection and disease management. Uh, GeneSeq still continues to use the ABI and Litecore platforms, but as the company has grown, it has also begun to utilize other platforms. Two other platforms that GeneSeq has incorporated into its workflow are ELISA and real-time PCR, which are utilized by GeneSeq's veterinary diagnostics labs, which focuses on pathogen detection for disease management. Uh, along the years, GeneSeq has also invested in several Agena mass arrays, which it uses for its sequinome platform. Uh, this, this platform is unique because it provided GeneSeq with the ability to offer its customers SNP, uh, custom SNP panels for marker-assisted selection and identity management. Uh, along with the Agena mass arrays, uh, GeneSeq also invested in several technologies, other technologies, including Illumina's eye scans and Affymetrix's Gene Titan. Uh, by investing in technologies such as these, uh, GeneSeq was able to develop products with higher density SNP profiling. And finally, that brings us to Thermo Fisher's Ion Torrent and Illumina's MySeq and NextSeq. Uh, these are technologies that GeneSeq is currently using to develop its genotype by sequencing platform. And the reason that uh, we're interested in these platforms is because it'll allow us to develop a product that is able to uh, sequence whole genomes in 16S amplicons. Uh, these genotype by sequencing technologies are some of the most recent platforms that GeneSeq has in, uh, introduced into its workflow. And the reason that we are interested in developing these platforms is that they are capable of utilizing a highly multiplexed and cost-effective next-generation sequencing approach for genomic selection. Uh, the reason that this is a possibility is that these platforms utilize custom-generated high-specificity uh, high primers that are barcoded bar to target sequences of interest. And one of the genotype by sequencing technologies that GeneSeq is most interested in utilizing is the eye and ample seq uh, protocol developed by Thermo Fisher. The reason that GeneSeq is interested in utilizing the eye and ample seq technology is due to some of the advantages that are offered by, by its protocol. Uh, that includes targeted genotyping and SNP discovery, uh, pick and play flexibility, which provides the ability to multiplex primer pools and barcode samples, and the protocol produces highly accurate SNP calling. Uh, the workflow of the eye and ample seq protocol, protocol itself can be divided into four procedures. And with the help of Thermo Fisher, GeneSeq has been able to take the workflow of the eye and ample seq protocol and modify it to run at a commercial level. And that's starting with the construction of the library. 
Uh, the process of constructing the library begins when we receive our samples from our customers and we take those samples and arrange them into a 96 well plate format. Uh, once those samples have been formatted, they are uh, extracted and purified, purified using magnetic beads and the concentration of the purified samples is uh, measured using a fluorometer to ensure that we're using the correct amount of DNA in our processing. After the concentration of the samples have been determined, they are passed off to me in the sequencing lab. Once I have received the samples for processing, I will transfer the required volume of DNA needed for the ion AmpliSeq protocol into a, new, uh, into a 96 wall hard shell pl PCR plate. Uh, we've been able to automate the DNA transfer through the use of the TomTech Quadra 4, and through the use of this automation, we are quick, able to quickly and efficiently uh, plate several hundred samples at the same time. Uh, this process has been automated even further, though, through the use of the Hamilton Star, a robot that we use to prepare PCR reactions. The Hamilton Star prepares the reagents needed for the PCR reaction and adds the reagents to the DNA that was transferred using the TomTech. Uh, these samples are then put into a 96 volt thermocycler where the PCR action can be carried out. Once the PCR action has been completed, a reagent called FUPA is added to all the amplified samples and the plate is added back to the cycler, allowing the FUPA reagent to partially digest the primer sequences. After this digestion is completed, uh, uh, custom bar generated barcodes, sorry about that, custom barcodes generated by Thermo Fisher and DNA ligase are added to the digested primer sequences. The plate is added back into the cycler one more time and the barcodes are added to the digested primer sequence producing the constructed library. Uh, one of the greatest challenges that we faced while modifying the procedures of the ion ample seq workflow was discovering a way to automate the process. On some of my earlier slides, I mentioned our use of the TomTech Quadra 4 and uh, the Hamilton Star, but these are robots that we use in pre-PCR processing. This provided us with the challenge of finding a robot that could effectively handle the ion ample seq protocol during post-PCR processing. We were able to find the solution through the use of the TCAN Fluent. The TCAN Fluent has proven to be a vital part in the automation of the PCR processing, allowing us to process 384 samples at the same time. The Fluent is used for both of the processes mentioned in my last two slides, where it is used to add the FUPA reagent, the custom barcodes, and the DNA ligase. Uh, while the Fluent has been a key part in the, automation, uh, the automated procedure of constructing the library, it has also plays, played a vital role in the next procedure of the ion AmpliSeq workflow, and that is the preparation of the template. The first step of preparing the template involves purifying the unamplified library. To do this, the Fluent is used to add ampere beads to the libraries, and then the Fluent washes the bead-bound libraries with ethanol. Once the libraries have been washed, the fluent adds a primer mix to the unamplified libraries and they are added to a cycler where the libraries can be amplified. After amplification, the libraries are added back into the fluent, which is used to add equalizer beads. The equalizer beads are used to ensure that the concentration of each library is even across the board. Uh, once the equalizer beads have been added to the libraries, the TCAN will clean the libraries with a wash buffer provided by Thermo Fisher. After the TCAN has washed the libraries, it will elute the libraries from the beads and transfer the eluted sample to a new 96 well plate. The eluted libraries are then pooled together to form a single sample, and in our current processing, we are only pulling up to 192 samples together. The pooled sample is then added to the Ion Chef, which will then finish the procedure of preparing the template by adding the pooled sample to the Ion P1 chip. And the way that this chip works is that it possesses millions of wells that contain a template bead that is capable of performing a microsequencing reaction when once, it, oh, once a sample has been added to the well. That brings us to the next procedure in the ion AmpliSeq workflow, which is to run the sequence. And the way that this is done is by taking the chip that was prepared using the ion chef and adding it to the ion proton. The way that the proton runs the sequence is that it flows several reagents and DNTPs across the chip. As these reagents flow across the chip, the proton monitors changes in pH. And that pH is measured as each base is incorporated into the template DNA by polymerase. Uh, once the proton is finished with the sequence, sequencing the run, we are able to move into the final procedure of the ion AmpliSeq workflow, which is to analyze the resulting data. 
This is a look of the initial data that is provided by the iontorrent browser. When analyzing the data, one of the first areas that we observe is the heat map that is provided. Analysis of the heat map provides us with a general consensus on whether or not the run was successful. If a majority of the chip is red, this indicates that the run worked successfully because it indicates that most of the beads on the chip bound to a sequence from the, uh, from the pooled sample. If the heat map were to appear blue, this would indicate that there were no sequences bound to the beads on the chip. Another area of interest is the initial data provided by the iontorrent browser is the ISP loading percentage. A higher loading percentage indicates that the, uh, the amplifications that were performed earlier in the procedure were successful. In GeneSeq's case, a uh, high loading percentage is usually one that is greater than 80%. Lower loading percentages indicate problems with amplification, which can be used to determine whether certain parts of the amplification process need modification. In the initial data, we are also interested in the ratio of clonal to polyclonal samples. For the most part, a successful run will always have a higher number of clonal samples than polyclonal samples. GeneSeq has found that for its needs, the clonal to polyclonal clonal ratio needs to be somewhere around seven to three. If this ratio is off and the number of polyclonal samples greatly outnumbers the number of clonal samples, this suggests that an incorrect amount of pooled DNA was loaded into the ion chef for template preparation. And the final piece of data that we're interested that's provided by the ion torrent browser is the total number of reads that are generated by the run. The number of reads that are generated per run affects the amount of data that we are able to collect for each sample, so we're looking to generate the highest number of reads possible. With our modified process, we are currently generating on average 80 million reads per run, meaning each sample on, on average is generating around 400,000 reads. While we have found that this number of reads is sufficient enough to provide us with some of the data that we need to provide to our customers, we are still working to improve the process to possibly generate even more reads. Not only does the ion torrent browser provide us with the initial data that was shown in the previous slides, it also generates a large amount of raw data for each sample. One of the pieces of raw data that the ion torrent browser provides that is demonstrated on this slide is the whole genome coverage of the sample. And with this, we can see the average number of SNPs per chromosome. The ion tor torrent software also possesses the, the ability to view specific locations on the chromosome of the genome. On this specific slide, we can see how the iontor software can be used to report certain genetic traits. Uh, here we can see that the, uh, the exact location of the SNP for neuropathic hydrocephalus. From the sequence located at the bottom of the, the slide, which is the reference sequence, we can see that in this position, an A, sorry, an A nucleotide was expected to be found at this location. Uh, for this specific sample, a total number of 97 reads were generated for this run, and 97% of those reads were found to match the reference sequence. In this case, no SNPs were detected, and the sample would be reported as, as wild type, or in other words, the individual carrying these genes does not possess the genetic trait, nor is it a carrier. While we have been able to use the iontorrent software to identify certain genetic traits, there are still some SNPs that the software is having troubles identifying. Uh, in the case of this specific SNP, we can see that from the reference sequence that a C nucleotide was expected to be found in the first column, but instead we're finding that a T nucleotide appears instead. This also occurs in the second column where a G was expected to be found, or uh, an A was expected to be found, but an a, nucleo a nucleotide was called instead. The reason that this is unusual is that the first column is called as absent, as you can see by this table here, while the second column is called as heterozygous. Uh, and when we compare the reference sequence to the generated sequence, we would expect both columns to be called as heterozygous. The reason that a problem like this could possibly occur depends on how the pipeline is established. Our current pipeline is designed only to report mutations located at hotspot, at hotspot locations, and it filters out anything that is marked as absent or novel. And the reason that this is a problem is that we could miss several data points, or we could miss several data points, or those data points could be misinterpreted. Uh, this is something that within the, d the data analysis proportion of the ion AmpleSeq workflow that we are currently trying to fix, and GeneSeq's data team is currently working with Thermar Fisher to uh, fix this issue, and we're hoping to have it resolved in the very near future. Uh, this is another example of a SNP that would, be pr that would produce no call because the, uh, it would be filtered out by the pipeline. The reason that this specific SNP would be filtered out is slightly different than the SNP that was shown in the previous slide. Uh, 
the reason that the pipeline would filter this SNP out is that the ratio of reads for one strand greatly outnumbers the read for the other strand, which creates a strand bias. In this case, though, this might not be an issue related to the data, but more to the uh, processing side of the procedure. To produce a successful call for this SNP, all that may be needed is an increase in the number of reads for this sequence. Thus, the solution of this issue might rest in improving the amplification process of the procedure. Although this SNP is filtered out by the pipeline it, pipeline, it also shows an advantage of using the I and AmpSeq protocol because for a SNP to be called, multiple reads are needed and this aspect of the pro protocol offers better coverage. While we are still currently working on uh, ironing out some of the issues that we're experiencing between the I and Torrent software and our own pipeline, there are still several other SNPs of interest that we, are ha that we have been able to identify. Another genetic trait that can be identified using the ion torrent software is coat color. The fact that the ion AmpleSeq protocol is capable of identifying, uh, identifying traits such as this truly shows the protocol's pick and play flexibility because we are able to take certain markers from the Illumina and Sequinome platforms and translate them over to be used in this protocol, which means that some of the SNPs that detected using the Illumina and Sequinome platforms can also be, be detected using the ion AmpleSeq protocol. While our current goal is to improve the pipeline to allow us to report genetic traits such as tenderness and parentage, once we have, have this aspect of the pipeline com completed, we know that there are other markers that can be added which allows us to report more genetic traits back to our customer. So, from the modifications that we made to the ion AmpliSeq protocol and the data that we've analyzed from these, mo th from these modified runs, we've been able to make the following conclusions and that is we are able to successfully process 192 samples per run and that we only need a small concentration of DNA for it, for it to be successful. Uh, also, through the use of uh, equalization, it allows us to run a high number of samples and pull them together and add them to the ion chef. And finally, in our current processing, we are able to generate on average 80 million reads and from those 80 million, million reads, we are able to determine some genetic traits. With Thermo Fisher's help, we have been able to make great strides with this process, but we are not finished making improvements. We want to be able to offer the best product to our customers. Some of the ways that we are looking to improve this process are to begin using a new version of the primer pool we use for amplification. Through our data analysis, we have found that in our first version of our primer pool, there were just some markers that weren't working or performing well as others. We reported those markers to Thermo, and they've worked with us to generate a new primer pool that we hope will work even, that we are planning that will work even better than the last. We are also working on other ways to modify the ion AmpleSeq protocol. One of the ways that we are looking to do this is through the use of half reactions. Uh, we've actually done some research and development on the use of half reactions, and what we have found is that there's no, there's, for our processing, there's no difference between a half and full reaction. And due to this discovery, we're plan uh, planning to run most of our reactions at a half reaction pace. And also, we are hoping to double the number of samples that are processed per run, increasing the number of samples from 192 to 384. This platform, uh, finally, uh, we are currently only running the platform to rerun on beef samples, but we are also currently doing research and development on a primer pool for samples to be grown on porcine, which we are hoping to offer to our customers in the very near future. Uh, this brings my presentation to a conclusion, and I would just like to thank you on behalf of GeneSeq and Thermo Fisher for attending this presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to contact GeneSeqInfo at Neogen.com or come visit us at our booth located at uh, 318 or uh, Thermo Fisher at booth 111. Uh, I still have quite a bit of time, so if you have any questions or uh, on the process, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you.